Plus, from the thoroughfares, so tender a concealment of everything which might affront the eye and the nerves of the bourgeoisie, as in Manchester. And yet, in other respects, Manchester is less built according to a plan, after official regulations, is more an outgrowth of accident, than any other city, and when I consider in this connection the eager assurances of the middle class, that the working class is doing famously, I cannot help feeling, that the liberal manufacturers, the bigwigs of Manchester, are not so innocent after all. In the matter of this sensitive method of construction, I may mention just here, that the mills almost all adjoin the rivers or the different canals, that ramify throughout the city, before I proceed at once, to describe the labouring quarters. First of all, there is the old town of Manchester, which lies between the northern boundary of the commercial district and the Irk. Here the streets, even the better ones, are narrow and winding, as Todd Street, Long Millgate, Woodby Grove, and Shoot Hill, the houses dirty, old, and tumble down, and the construction of the side streets utterly horrible. Going from the old church to Long Millgate, the stroller has at once a row of old-fashioned houses at the right, of which not one has kept its original level, these are remnants of the old pre-manufacturing Manchester, whose former inhabitants have removed with their descendants into better-built districts, and have left the houses, which were not good enough for them, to a population strongly mixed with Irish blood. Here one is in an almost undisguised workingman's quarter, for even the shops and bee houses hardly take the trouble to exhibit a trifling degree of cleanliness. But all this is nothing in comparison with the courts and lanes which lie behind, to which access can be gained only through covered passages, in which no two human beings can pass at the same time. Of the irregular cramming together of dwellings in ways which defy all rational plan, of the tangle in which they are crowded literally one upon the other, it is impossible to convey an idea. And it is not the buildings surviving from the old times of Manchester which are to blame for this, the confusion has only recently reached its height when every scrap of space left by the old way of building, has been filled up, and patched over until not a foot of land is left to be further occupied. The south bank of the Irk is here very steep, and between 15 and 30 feet high. On this declivitous hillside there are planted three rows of houses, of which the lowest rise directly out of the river, while the front walls of the highest stand on the crest of the hill in Long Millgate. Among them are mills on the river, in short, the method of construction is as crowded and disorderly here as in the lower part of Long Millgate. Right and left a multitude of covered passages lead from the main street into numerous courts, and he who turns in thither gets into a filth and disgusting grime, the equal of which is not to be found, especially in the courts, which lead down to the Irk, and which contain unqualifiedly the most horrible dwellings which I have yet beheld. In one of these courts there stands directly at the entrance, at the end of the covered passage, a privy without a door, so dirty that the inhabitants can pass into and out of the court, only by passing through foul pools of stagnant urine and excrement. This is the first court on the Irk above Ducey Bridge, in case anyone should care to look into it. Below it on the river there are several tanneries which fill the whole neighborhood with the stench of animal putrefaction. Below to Sea Bridge the only entrance to most of the houses is by means of narrow, dirty stairs and over heaps of refuse and filth. The first court below Ducey Bridge, known as Allen's Court, was in such a state at the time of the cholera, that the sanitary police ordered it evacuated, swept, and disinfected with chloride of lime. Dr. K gives a terrible description of the state of this court at that time 49 since then, it seems to have been partially torn away and rebuilt, at least looking down from Ducey Bridge, the passerby sees several ruined walls and heaps of debris with some newer houses. The view from this bridge, mercifully concealed from mortals of small stature by a parapet as high as a man, is characteristic for the whole district. At the bottom flows, or rather stagnates, the Irk, a narrow cold black foul-smelling stream full of debris and refuse, which it deposits on the shallower right bank. In dry weather, a long string of the most disgusting, blackish-green slime pools are left standing on this bank, from the depths of which bubbles of miasmatic gas constantly arise and give forth a stench unendurable even on the bridge 40 or 50 feet above the surface of the stream. But besides this, the stream itself is checked every few paces by high weirs, behind which slime and refuse accumulate and rot in thick masses. Above the bridge are tanneries, bone mills, and gas walks, from which all drains and refuse find their way into the Irk, which receives further the contents of all the neighboring sewers and privies. It may be easily imagined, 
Therefore, what sort of residue the stream deposits? Below the bridge you look upon the piles of debris, the refuse, filth, and offal from the courts on the steep left bank. Here each house is packed close behind its neighbor and a piece of each is visible, all black, smoky, crumbling, ancient, with broken panes and window frames. The background is furnished by old barrack-like factory buildings. On the lower right bank stands a long row of houses and mills, the second house being a ruin without a roof, piled with debris, the third stands so low, that the lowest floor is uninhabitable, and therefore without windows or doors. Here the background embraces the pauper burial ground, the station of the Liverpool and Leeds Railway, and, in the rear of this, the workhouse, the Paul or Bastille of Manchester, which, like a citadel, looks threateningly down from behind its high walls and parapets on the hilltop upon the working people's quarter below. Above Ducey Bridge, the left bank grows more flat and the right bank steeper, but the condition of the dwellings on both banks grows worse rather than better. He who turns to the left here from the main street, Long Millgate, is lost. He wanders from one court to another, turns countless corners, passes nothing but narrow, filthy nooks and alleys, until after a few minutes he has lost all clue, and knows not whither to turn. Everywhere half or wholly ruined buildings, some of them actually uninhabited, which means a great deal here, rarely a wooden or stone floor, to be seen in the houses, almost uniformly broken, ill-fitting windows and doors, and a state of filth. Everywhere heaps of debris, refuse, and offal, standing pools for gutters, and a stench which alone would make it impossible for a human being in any degree civilized to live in such a district. The newly built extension of the Leeds Railway, which crosses the Irk here, has swept away some of these courts and lanes, laying others completely open to view. Immediately under the railway bridge there stands a court, the filth and horrors of which surpass all the others by far, just because it was hitherto so shut off, so secluded that the way to it could not be found without a good deal of trouble. I should never have discovered it myself, without the breaks made by the railway, though I thought I knew this whole region thoroughly. Passing along a rough bank, among stakes and washing lines, one penetrates into this chaos of small one-storied one-roomed huts, in most of which there is no artificial floor, kitchen, living and sleeping room all in one. In such a hole, scarcely five feet long by six broad, I found two beds, and such bedsteads and beds, which, with a staircase and chimney place, exactly filled the room. In several others I found absolutely nothing while the door stood open, and the inhabitants leaned against it. Everywhere before the doors refuse and offal, that any sort of pavement lay underneath could not be seen but only felt, here and there, with the feet. This whole collection of cattle sheds for human beings was surrounded on two sides by houses and a factory, and on the third by the river, and besides the narrow stair up the bank, a narrow doorway alone led out into another almost equally ill-built ill-kept labyrinth of dwellings. Enough. The whole side of the oak is built in this way, a planless, knotted chaos of houses, more or less on the verge of uninhabitableness, whose unclean interiors fully correspond with their filthy external surroundings. And how could the people be clean with no proper opportunity for satisfying the most natural and ordinary wants? Privies are so rare here, that they are either filled up every day, or are too remote for most of the inhabitants to use. How can people wash, when they have only the dirty oak water at hand, while pumps and water pipes can be found in decent parts of the city alone? In truth, it cannot be charged to the account of these helots of modern society, if their dwellings are not more cleanly than the pigsties which are here and there, to be seen among them. The landlords are not ashamed to let dwellings like the six or seven cellars on the quay directly below Scotland Bridge, the floors of which stand at least two feet below the low water level of the oak that flows not six feet away from them, or like the upper floor of the corner house on the opposite shore directly above the bridge, where the ground floor, utterly uninhabitable, stands deprived of all fittings for doors and windows, a case by no means rare in this region, when this open ground floor is used as a privy by the whole neighborhood for want of other facilities. If we leave the oak, and penetrate once more on the opposite side from Long Mill Gate into the midst of the working men's dwellings, we shall come into a somewhat newer quarter, which stretches from St. Michael's Church to Withy Grove and Shoot Hill. Here there is somewhat better order. In place of the chaos of buildings, we find at least long straight lanes and alleys or courts, built according to a plan unusually square. 
but if, in the former case, every house was built according to caprice, here each lane and court is so built, without reference to the situation of the adjoining ones. The lanes run now in this direction, now in that, while every two minutes the wanderer gets into a blind alley, or, on turning a corner, 